people. That's fine. So uh, 800 years BC, the seed of a civilization, uh, a startup, if you will, a startup that would go on to scale and sustain itself for over 2,000 years, started on seven hills in Central Europe. Now, at the peak of its power, the Roman Empire accounted for nearly 2 million square miles and roughly incorporated about 20% of the world's population. Now, there's many hypotheses about what enabled this to happen, how the Roman Empire not only started, scaled, and sustained itself for over 2,000 years. Does anybody want to take a guess? Roads, great, thank you. Roads always comes up. Good. What else? Sorry? Military, yeah, good. That always comes up as well, too. Good. So, hey? Pollution, good, yeah. Yeah, aqueducts, all these, all these great things, right? They're super cool inventions. Um, but the truth is, the thing that was most powerful um, and interesting about the systems the Roman created was, as soon as they conquered over other civilizations, they let go of their existing behaviors when they found behaviors that were better than their own. As they conquered these civilizations, they recognized and learned and also unlearned their existing behavior and incorporated those behaviors into their systems of work to innovate the way that they work. Now, this is a sort of an idea that has lasted for many years. Organizations, we're all working in learning organizations, right? Who here doesn't believe that they don't have to continuously learn in their job? And it's not a new thing, right? Learning organizations pretty much started to be discussed around the 1980s. They were the vogue of every business management organization training program that you could actually do. And they actually exploded onto the mainstream with the release of Peter Singh's book in, in 1990, introducing the concepts of sifting thinking and, and, and these learning organizations. And every executive was going through Stanford, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, getting their, uh, sitting in a classroom for a week and getting their uh, learning organization um, certification to get better. So, but at the same time, while everybody was in vogue with the learning organizations, a very similar paper came out by Bo Handelberg around 1981. And what he also highlighted that learning was just one part of the equation. Because at the same time, while we are learning new information, it's also important that we unlearn existing information. Because knowledge ultimately becomes obsolete. The world changes, technology changes, economics changes, our customer demand changes. And if you're holding on to methods and thinking that are actually out of date, you're impacting your ability to innovate and achieve the outcomes that you want. Now, while these things were happening, very little was actually changing in our world and our society. Uh, the world's largest organizations, even 10 years after uh, Singh's book, you, know, you had these same big scale organizations that were, were running everything. And 10 years after that, very little things changed. Everybody was a learning organization, but there was no real change until everything changed. Organizations that started to create platforms to where they could synthesize massive amounts of data, understand how customers interact with their systems, how their systems were performing, and make changes based on what they were both learning and needed to unlearn to innovate their businesses. You know, this is a very typical way about how innovation happens. Most people and leaders are trapped in a very linear mindset of the world. They believe the things that made them successful yesterday will be the things that make them successful in the future again. So they replicate, they copy and paste their methods into every single scenario and context that they go into. Um, but technology doesn't work like that. It's exponential curves, things that change. Nothing changes, then suddenly everything changes. So if you don't have a system to continually innovate and adapt your behaviors, you're in trouble. Because my belief is it's not organizations that actually get disrupted. It's actually the individuals who lead those organizations. Because they get trapped holding on to outdated methods and legacy behaviors and not constantly adapting to the new context and the changes that they're in. 
So this really got me thinking about why both learning and unlearning is a really, really important thing. Um, and what I found from working with these great leaders is that they are constantly cultivating in themselves opportunities where they can unlearn. So my definition of unlearning is this. It's a conscious act of letting go of outdated information and actively engaging in taking in new information to inform your decision making in action. And this is what I found from working with some of the most phenomenal leaders in the world, is that they're constantly trying to put themselves in uncomfortable positions. They're cultivating a thing in themselves to challenge their existing paradigms, to grow, to have impact, and experiment their way to get there. Now, there's some very obviously signals about when you probably need to unlearn, and most people don't think about these. The way I would describe it to you is this. You know, you probably need to unlearn is when you're trying to solve a problem with your existing methods and, and, and you're not actually achieving it. When you're not living up to the expectations you have of yourself and you're struggling, or you're actually trying to avoid certain issues. Because you're probably using behaviors that don't work are aligned to the outcome that you're trying to achieve. You're stuck. So when I was working with a lot of these leaders, it sort of got me thinking that there's actually a system here. I wanted to create a system to help them continuously adapt their behaviors to the context that they were in and the outcomes that were our aspirations they were trying to achieve. And this sort of uh, helped me create this concept of a cycle of unlearning, where I would get them to start to think about aspects they wanted to unlearn, where they were struggling, where they were not living up to their expectations, where they were not achieving the desired outcomes that they wanted. And then create a space for them to relearn to rapidly experiment with new behaviors, new methods, new thinking, and learn, actually break their mental models of the world and get the breakthroughs that they're looking for to achieve higher performance and the results that they want. But the thing about this is it's not sort of a one and done cycle. It's a continuous process of adapting to the context and the circumstances that you're facing because uh, they're constantly changing. So the power of a cycle of unlearning is when you go through the loop once, you might get a great breakthrough but the more you go through it, it becomes a virtuous cycle. It encourages you to constantly adapt your behaviors to the context and the situations you're facing. So, who here is working on a current transformation, innovation initiative somewhere in their organization right now? All right, pretty much the whole room. What's the big speech that happens at the start of the initiative? What does the leader come out and always say? Get ready for change. Sweet. What else? OK, that's all they say? Good. All right. <laughs> well, normally what happens in the one I'm in, it's always, we need to transform. But what are they really saying? Thank you very much. You all need to transform. I'm just going to keep doing what I've always been doing. All right? And this is sort of uh, the classic sort of behavior that we all come up with, right? We'd be successful if that ch team just changed the way they worked. We'd be successful if that other person just worked differently. Everybody thinks about transforming somebody else. Nobody thinks about transforming themselves. Um, and this sort of was a problem for me also. I was constantly working on these sort of innovation transformation initiatives, working on these sort of innovation projects on the side of the system, on the sides of these organizations. And while some of these uh, initiatives were successful and we'd build great products and create new behaviors in the organization, they never really had a systemic impact across the entire organization. So it sort of got me thinking that the way we approach transformation is actually wrong and needs to be unlearned. And, and it got me thinking about, well, it, if we're working in these complex adaptive systems, really what I needed to do was uh, impact the nodes with the most influence on that system. And how could I start to create an opportunity for them to unlearn and relearn and get the breakthroughs that they needed to have a systemic impact on the organization and change the way people worked. So that got, inspired me to start something that I call Exec Camp. Now, Exec Camp is basically a program where I get executives to leave their business for anywhere between four to eight weeks with the goal of launching new businesses to disrupt their existing businesses. Now, normally when I say that to people, most people sort of freak out a little bit and go, that's, that's not possible. The, actually, the sort of reaction I typically get is something like this. And I'm like, don't worry, I've got a diagram that wiggles and goes up to the right. Uh, everything's going to be fine. 
you know, because you don't change the way you behave by just thinking differently or acting differently. You need to deliberately practice experimentation of new behaviors to start to get the breakthroughs that you need. But there's also a number of characteristics that I've learned from doing this exec camp. And I'll share some examples of the companies I've been working with doing it, from some of the world's largest airlines to the largest banks and, and so forth across the world. But this is what I've constantly learned um, is required if you really want to unlearn. Uh, curiosity. So how many times the gift of expertise, when someone in your team has come to you with a way to solve a problem, not the way that you would have solved it, have you corrected them? Or have you asked them, that's interesting. Why did you think that? How curious are you really to find out new information and adapt it? Or do you just push your expertise onto other individuals, especially junior people? Courage. How good are you at recognizing that your own behaviors are actually not being effective, that they're not working? It's really easy to just say it's somebody else's fault. It's real hard to take the accountability in yourself and recognize that it's your behavior that's limiting. Commitment. How willing are you to try and actually prolonged, deliberately practice new behaviors and new methods where you're going to struggle at them, where you're going to suck at them, where you're not going to be the best, where your competency that has made you great is now one of your biggest weaknesses and limiting factors. And then this concept of being comfortable with getting uncomfortable. And I can't stress this enough. All the greatest growth and impact that I've had in my career is when I got outside my comfort zone, where I was just out of my depth and my toes just about touching the bottom. Because that's where your growth happens. How actively are you creating scenarios for you to be uncomfortable? Uh, and the way this is achieved is actually by creating safety. And safety operates at many different levels. It can be mental safety, psychological safety with your team, how you feel trusted. It can be physical safety by taking small steps and safe to fail experiments that you can recreate coverable situations. Uh, and also economic safety, small risks, small investments that allow you to learn quickly. So these are some of the characteristics that I've learned are really key if you are serious about not only wanting to learn, but unlearn, relearn, and get the breakthroughs that will lead you to what I believe extraordinary results. So what I'm going to do is share a couple of examples of the companies that I've been working with and some of the uh, uh, learnings and unlearnings that we had to go through. And hopefully that will provide you a little bit of inspiration and a pathway for your own unlearning journeys. Uh, the first one I love to start with is mindset, simply because in every organization I go into, one of the first things I always hear is that we we innovate here, we've just got a mindset problem. Or even better, we just need to change the mindset, and then everything will be best. So currently, what are the methods that we use to change people's mindset? Guilt, Guilt. nice. <laughs> well. We spend $365 billion a year in executive development, sitting people in rooms and talking at them for five days and handing them certificates to walk out the door. And less than one in four people say that this is actually effective. The whole methods that we have for teaching actually need to be unlearned. You see, you don't change people's mindset by telling them to think differently and then suddenly hoping they're going to act differently. I think because Apple had an advert called Think Differently and everybody idolizes Steve Jobs, suddenly people just went around saying, we just need to think differently in our organization, and then suddenly it's going to be great. Who here has sat in a two-day certified Scrum Maniac class and then on the third day walked out and changed all their behaviors? Now, the way you start to shift your mindset is not thinking differently. It's actually acting differently. Because when you start to act differently, you start to get a new perspective of the world. And you start to get new information that runs counter to your existing mental models of the world. And by getting that delta, that's actually what shifts your mindset. So the trick is, if you want to start thinking differently, you've got to start acting differently. Because that starts to give you a new perspective. And when you have a new perspective, that's what starts to shift your mindset. And by shifting your mindset and starting to see the benefits of new behaviors, it actually then becomes a virtuous circle. It continues you to keep challenging your mindset and thinking, challenging your behaviors, and constantly adapting 
to the circumstances that you're facing. So one example of this is um, I work with a company called International Airlines Group. Some people might know them. They're the parent company of British Airways, Iberian, Velling, Aer Lingus. They have basically the sixth largest airline in the world and about uh, 65,000 employees. So I work with their executive leadership team. And I took uh, six of their most senior people out of their operating companies for eight weeks with the goal of creating six new transformational ideas to totally revolutionize the industry. But as a result of that, the byproduct was not necessarily just to shift the new behaviors and teach people. It was to help their executive team actually unlearn a lot of their existing approaches to innovation. And normally when I tell people about this, they go, that's absolutely crazy. Why would you do that? Well, IAG recognized that they couldn't just keep sending people on one day innovation off sites. They couldn't keep doing the quarterly hack because it wasn't changing systemically their approach to innovation. Insanity is doing the same things and expecting a different result, as someone once said. So this isn't so radical. This is actually taking a brave step, t showing courage that maybe the things that you're doing are not working, and the commitment to try something different. And one of the first things we did uh, when we were on this uh, uh, camp was basically got a lot of the executives in the room. And one of them, who was one of the most senior people in the airline group, had this amazing idea that was going to transform the airline industry. All we had to do was build our idea. So we sat down, and they were like, this is brilliant. I've got a way that we can change all the booking airlines. We just have to implement my idea. So I sat down, and we, we heard about the idea. And we thought, well, well, why don't we just go and test that idea with a customer? The executive was like, sweet, great, get me a customer in here. So how do you think the first test went? The executive drew out this perfect prototype, showed it to a customer. What do you think happened? A customer hated it. What do you think the executive's response was? Silly customer, bring me the right customer. <laughs> like, Sweet, let's, let's, let's get the right customer in here. So we sat down and, and ran the experiment again. What do you think the result was? And again, and again, and again. But after about four uh, times going through this process, we sat down to reflect and retrospect on what was happening and asked the executive, what do you think the problem is? And they were like, the idea sucks. It's not the customer. That executive went on to be one of the best experimenters I think I've ever worked with. That was their unlearning moment. Because their 20 years in the industry had been about pushing their expertise onto people, not pulling the information that they needed from their customers to inform what they should be doing and innovating. But it also started to reactivate their curiosity. They started to see everything that they did was essentially a hypothesis, a belief, an, an assumption to be tested, and how quickly they could create an experiment to test those assumptions and gather new information to inform their decision making and action was a super, super powerful thing. So every time they ran an experiment after that, they were creating new information on learning and relearning, innovating at speed. Now, um, this was a super, super uh, interesting initiative. We went on to create some fantastic ideas uh, in the airline industry. We created the first ever blockchain identity management system for the airline industry. We created machine learning algorithms that can synthesize customer data that used to take six minutes, uh, months to like minutes. Literally transformed uh, the way things are working. But we also had some ideas at the end of the eight weeks that we thought were great. And then our natural idea was to then just put them into the existing uh, governance and innovation process in the organizations. How do you think that went? Well, basically, we took a whole load of dollars and set them on fire. But again, this was another unlearning moment for us. Because these teams were already full to capacity with work that they had to do, their own ideas, their own context and problems that they were solving. And trying to push these new innovations into that funnel where people had no ownership, no accountability, no interest in a lot of these ideas was something that we had to unlearn. But it also gave us another great unlearning moment. As a result of that, we started to think about, well, why are we pushing again these ideas into our organization? Why don't we start pulling 
people into our organization and letting them have access to our assets that we can build amazing products and services on top. So uh, British Airways became the first airline to actually open up all their APIs available to developers and startups to start building on top of their uh, information, leveraging their assets in ways that they couldn't even see or think of before. Uh, they ended up creating the first ever venture capital firm for the airline industry called Hangar 51, where they actively take a stake in startups that are building on top of their assets and start innovating across their entire business. So these are like transformational ways about how these big, huge, highly bureaucratic, highly regulated organizations are fundamentally unlearning the way that they do innovation and getting extraordinary results. And while all these great new products and services are exciting and interesting, and the thing that has been most impactful and lasting for the organization is not necessarily the products and services that they've built. It's been the mindset shift of the leaders who were part of the exec camp and now have gone back into the organization and acting as coaches for other people in the organization as they start to unlearn how to do innovation. And this is why I love this quote from uh, Stephen Scott, who was the chief innovation officer for IAG at the time, now runs their Avias rewards business, is it's the moment where everybody tells you that you need to stop, that what you're doing is wrong. That's the moment where you have to double down and increase your experiment velocity. You need to actually go faster and iterate quicker to find the breakthroughs that you need to get to extraordinary results. So I think you know, while all these things are really, really important about shifting mindset and uh, leadership mindset specifically, there's also a challenge, again, of this expertise. And one of the things I think is really, really important for a lot of people, especially leaders in their organizations, is we have to be on learn being a know-it-all and move to a learn it all. And this is really, really difficult when you're an expert and your competency is actually what has got you to the position that you're currently in. So I work with, um, let me just call them a very famous phone manufacturer. And some of their leadership team had created a strategy for how they were going to roll out these, their new phones across their organize, uh, over the world. Now, these people have been working in this industry for over 20 years. They're fantastic at what they do. They're excellent at business strategy. They design amazing systems that have a global impact. Now, one of the things about a vision for your company, a strategy for your business, they're all massive hypotheses. And the way you actually test the vision of your organization, the strategy of your organization, is you actually build products. Those products are just experiments for your organization. So when you've got a group of people who are designing strategy, how do you create experiments to help them learn if that hypothesis is valid or not? What could you do? Okay, so some of my job, I actually think, is safely breaking people's mental models of the world. Creating scenarios where people can get real information, unsanitized information, especially executives who are often very far removed from the front line, but are often fed poor quality data, sanitized data. So they make good decisions based on bad data, which lead to poor results. So the way I tried to help this leadership team test the hypothesis their strategy was this. They had designed this amazing strategy, very confident in it, wanted to roll it out. I asked them to be customers of their own strategy. I gave them prepaid credit cards and told them that they had two hours to go out and sign up for the own service that they had created. How do you think they got on? You can guess. Five of them went out. How do you think they got on? How many do you think were successful? Good, one. Correct. One out of five was able to sign up for the service. Uh, one of them nearly got it done and three totally failed miserably. Right, but, and it was a very interesting unlearning moment for them. Initially, they were frustrated. They were, why did you give me a pretty paid credit card? Why did the person behind the clerk couldn't get the, the system done in time? But what they started, when you sat down and reflect with them, you started to realize is that they are the designers of these systems. 
these systems of work are their products and services that they're launching into the world. And really, when you have these mistakes, these problems, they're signals from the system that your assumptions are actually incorrect. And if you use that information to improve the systems, you can create amazing products and services. Does anyone know who this is? This is John Lurge. He's the CEO of T-Mobile in America. He came into the role in September uh, 2012. Uh, at the time, AT&T, Verizon, literally uh, pr predominantly run the US market, their largest market share. Now, John had just come into the role as CEO of T-Mobile. So first day on the job, how would you find out? He didn't, wasn't necessarily working in the telco industry. How would you find out how well your organization was running and operating? What would be the first thing you would do if you were the CEO of, a, of an organization? Talk to the customer team, good, what else? What typically happens? Talk to the C-suite. Endless people walk in and give you PowerPoint presentations. Everybody pitches your idea. If they just listen to my idea, we're gonna innovate the business. Then you hire the analysts, they come in and tell you. What did John do? Well, John got a phone line installed in his office. A phone line directly to the customer service group. And he sat in his office for four hours a day, every day, for the first month, and just listened to customer complaints. To understand the signals from the system about things that were working and not working. What people understood and didn't understand. As a result of that, John did something that was transformational and what everybody here probably just thinks is a normal behavior now for the telco industry. John on, launched on, uh, on Carrier. Has anyone ever heard what this was? This was the first ever telco plan where you just paid $50 a month for 500 megabytes of data and a fixed amount of calls. Because at the time, nobody knew what their bills were gonna be. They were using their phones, there was high variability over costs, data cost, anytime you moved country, anywhere you went, you had no idea what your bills were gonna be. People didn't understand how their contracts worked. So he just simplified it. And overnight, T-Mobile blitzed the entire telco industry in the US. But he didn't stop there. Because unlearning is not like a one-time event, it's continuous. He started to uh, launch this on-carrier program and bring out crazy things like any uh, jump to upgrade. You didn't have to wait two years to wait for the next iPhone. You could get it whenever you wanted. Didn't have to wait for tablets. You buy the tablets, you get free data with it. All the things that you out there probably today consider normal behaviors were innovated by T-Mobile and John by sitting there and listening to what his customers had to say and using that information, that raw sanitized feed to improve his systems of work, adapt his business strategy, and obliterate the competition. T-Mobile has grown like by 50. So when you're in a highly commoditized industry, the only way you can win is you have to take business away from your competitors. The only telco that's growing in North America is T-Mobile. It's gone from the fourth to the third largest. It's just bought Sprint. They're now gonna own probably in the region of 60% of the entire market in five years. That's transformational. And you know, this idea of listening to customers, how often do your executive team listen to customers? When's the last time you listened to a customer? When's the last time you sat down and heard information from your customers to change and adapt your roadmap? A week, a month, a year? I just came from reInvent, um, which is an overwhelming event in itself. But this is what Amazon do. 95% of their features are driven from customer insight. That's Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon.com, saying that's how they drive and make decisions. It's based on the information they gather from customers. They're not a know-it-all, they're a learn-it-all, an unlearn-it-all, relearn and get breakthroughs to lead to amazing results. So the last thing I also want you to think about then is mistakes. Because we have to start on learning mistakes and what mistakes mean. Because mistakes are signals from your systems that the assumptions you have are incorrect. 
And my argument is, if you can harness the power of those insights, if you can use those signals to create more resilient, more responsive systems, mistakes can become the biggest competitive advantage you'll ever have in your organization. You need to unlearn mistakes that lead to catastrophe and see mistakes as leading to competitive advantage. On January, uh, two, uh, uh, on January 26, 1986, the Challenger space shuttle took off and exploded 72 seconds after launch. Now at the time, the engineers had told Mission Command not to launch, but they overrode them and, and, and launched. NASA had had this amazing run of firsts. First spacewalk, you know, all these amazing things. For, the shuttle program was a phenomenal success until that point. When this uh, Challenger event happened, most people actually within NASA thought it was an uh, act of God, that it was just an exception, something crazy that happened. They didn't see it as a behavior that could have been addressed. See, there's really, really smart people in NASA. And those really, really smart people were creating knowledge towers. And those towers ultimately were turning into silos. And they were not moving any information around their organization. And the Columbia, until the Columbia disaster again uh, a few years later, where upon re-entry, there was actually a technical term for the tiles breaking off the space shuttle and hitting the plane. They called it foam shedding. But those mishaps uh, were not causing catastrophic failures. The plane was still landing. Again, most people thought it was a normal behavior. It wasn't a deviant behavior until uh, Columbia re-entered and, and broke apart upon entry. Now, uh, one of my mentors and collaborators is um, Dr. Ed Hoffman. He was the first ever chief knowledge officer of NASA. He created the, knowledge, the training program. And often what he said within NASA is, the problem is they had to fail really, really, really big before people would recognize that they needed to adapt their behavior. Um, and this isn't a, an uncommon problem in most organizations where you have really, really smart people. Smart people are, like to be right. They're used to being right. They actually come up with amazing convoluted scenarios about why they're right and why they could never be incorrect. They like to make those sorts of things. Um, and what I've, we found from uh, working together is that you needed to start moving information around the system. Because when you had those silos, people weren't able to share information. They were afraid to share any information because they didn't want to be wrong. They didn't want to look wrong. Now, there's two ways that you drive culture change in an organization. If anyone's ever read Edgar Stein, he's the primary thinker on organizational psychology and cultural transformation. And he talks about two different levers. You have survival anxiety and learning anxiety. Now, survival anxiety is this idea that I'm trying to peak your survival. If you don't do something, your business is going to be disrupted. If you don't do something, your business is going to die. Who's heard that in the last week or two? I right? hear it every week. Whose business is still here? So most people sort of hear it. It works for a period of time, and then they sort of stop listening, because nothing really changes until it does. The tap to unending innovation in your organization is not constantly peaking survival anxiety. It's reducing learning anxiety. How safe people feel to try new things in their organization. How will they be treated? How will their peers look upon them when they do things and they're not so great at it? And they have to adapt the way they work. Now, what we use to try and describe this uh, within a NASA group is people were afraid to share mistakes because smart people don't make mistakes. But what we, me and Ed would try to describe is that actually mistakes if aren't shared, lead to catastrophe. If they are shared, they become a competitive advantage. Because mistakes are when little problems happen. right? And if you can recognize and catch a mistake early, it avoids it becoming a mishap. A mishap is when you know, there was a failure, but the mission was successful. So it goes sort of unnoticed. But the problem is, if mistakes aren't dealt with and mishaps aren't dealt with, ultimately, they lead to catastrophic failures, like the shuttles exploding. So the trick is actually to try and create systems that allow you to mis surface mistakes quickly, cheaply, and socialize them across your organization to avoid them becoming mishaps. 
This isn't just a human system problem. This is how you start to get to really powerful software engineering methods about recognizing mistakes in your systems and responding to them quickly. But it requires safety. It requires reducing learning anxiety. Google did a, a famous study on finding the number one indicator for high performance organizations. It's not knowing how many M&Ms it takes to fill the Empire State Building. That's not uh, what, what leads to high performance in teams. It's actually having psychological safety. The ability to share information in front of one another, what worked and what didn't. So the way they started this in NASA was really, really, really small. They were thinking big, but starting small. Ed got together like a couple of the senior leaders in the different departments, and he'd get them, even just on lunch breaks, to showcase some mistakes that they had made and how that information had helped them avoid mishaps or even some mishaps that they had made and help, how it had helped them to avoid catastrophic failures. He started really small by just getting people comfortable with talking about mistakes. And then the leadership started to understand the power of, mis of sharing uh, mistakes. Now, what was typically happening for space programs is that a lot of the knowledge and policy about space programs was centrally dictated um, from Washington so people who were just researchers were essentially writing the policy for the space programs. And then the practitioners started to realize that actually the people with the best information were the people who were running and practicing and creating the experiments and learning these emergent fields. I'll give you an example. Space junk is a massive problem. Is anyone here in this room an expert on space junk? No, I didn't think so. There's not a lot of them. There's only a couple of people who actually have to deal with it when they run and launch satellites. So what started to happen is that the whole way that they did policy for NASA flipped. The practitioners started to write the policy documents. They started to use the, the emergent knowledge that they were learning from running this, uh, the launches and space missions and starting to share that within NASA, which then started to propagate and then shared back to policies. And they, uh, so you had this whole flip. It's like a whole company writing the Wikipedia for emergent knowledge for the space industry instead of a group of researchers trying to push it down on people. So this becomes a really, really powerful mechanism. If you can create a system that allows you to quickly and safely surface mistakes and use the mistakes, the information from that, those signals to improve your systems, you will blow away your competition. This is true not only for human systems, but it's true for your technology systems. That's the reason why things like chaos engineering are becoming so popular. It's using the telemetry of the technology to early recognize when you're having unintended consequences and rapidly react to those scenarios and improve your systems. Same in human systems if you can do that. But the other part about this is it's not just necessarily about always reducing this learning anxiety. To make sure that complacency doesn't sneak in, um, every year on the 27th of January, NASA actually shut down the entire uh, company. And they invite in the families of people who were involved in the Challenger and Columbia space disasters. And they ask those uh, families and, and people who worked on those programs to share stories about some of the mistakes that were made, how much they missed our family, the results of these catastrophic failures. Because today, less than 45% of the people who work in NASA work there when the Columbia disaster happened. So they don't want to use PowerPoints to tell you how to create better culture. They want people to tell authentic, real stories about what it takes to not let complacency set in, to reduce learning anxiety, to create great systems of work that recognize mistakes early and allow you to innovate your processes and systems of work. So, before you leave here today, I want you to think about, think big about an aspiration or outcome that you have about something you need to unlearn. Um, but there's a really, really easy way to start small to get there. So here's what you do. I want you to think about one thing that you think you need to unlearn. And then find somebody that you trust, somebody you might work with, and ask them on a scale of one to 10, 
how well you think you're performing trying to achieve the outcome that you're aiming for. And it's important that they score you between one and 10, a relative score. And then I want you to ask them to give you, suggest a couple of behaviors that you could try to just get half a point better. Write down the 10 behaviors. And I want you to try and pick the one that feels the most uncomfortable, or that's outside your comfort zone. And try that behavior for a week. And check back with that person that you trust to create a feedback loop to help you navigate as you start to unlearn. And I guarantee you, if you sit every week and just try and get half a point better, you'll actually get extraordinary results. Because big things can happen from really, really small things. On March uh, 2017, International Airlines Group launched an entire new airline. It is the first ever transatlantic low-cost carrier airline flying three routes from Europe to the US. On the first day, it sold 52,000 tickets. In the first month, it sold 153,000 tickets. All this started from a group of people who were willing to unlearn. They were curious, had the courage to recognize that innovation wasn't working in their organization, committed to it, got comfortable to be uncomfortable, and started to experiment. And now they've launched an entire new airline that's going to disrupt the entire airline industry for transatlantic travel. So what I want, and it's called Level. So what I want you to think about as you leave here today is the key to start on learning is you think big, but you gotta start small. Experiment with lots of different behaviors. Have the courage to recognize when things aren't working. And then try something that's uncomfortable. Don't stick doing the things that feel comfortable. You'll never grow and have impact in the world. But the way you get there is that you create safety. Design safe to fail experiments, safe methods. Start small with small steps that allow you rapidly Learn and take steps towards the bigger outcomes that you're trying to achieve. My name's been Barry O'Reilly. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. I've hopefully got a couple of time for some questions. Thanks very much.